Uh, welcome to this webinar sponsored by PSI, IT for Change, uh, and Friedrich Ibert Stiftung, FES. My name is Daniel Bertossa. I'll be your facilitator. And we have a great lineup today to discuss economic rights in a database society. And in particular, to look at the issues surrounding collective data ownership, workers' rights, and the role of the public sector. We're very excited to have Parminda Jeet Singh, who's the executive director from IT for Change, and is also the author of the paper we're officially releasing today, which is, uh, has the same title. To help us do that, we also have Rosa Pavanelli, the General Secretary of Public Services International, or PSI, which is the Global Union Federation that represents 30 million public sector workers across 170 countries. And we're also very lucky to have with us today, Christina Kolkoff, who's an independent expert on the future of work, and the politics of technology. It's a panel discussion today. So I'll be asking some questions from the speakers, then hopefully they'll have some discussion between them. And then finally, we'll be able to put some questions from all of you. Uh, only the panelists can speak, um, but if you have questions, please write them in the chat box uh, and everyone can see what you write in the chat box. So hopefully there'll be a lively debate going on in the chat box. Uh, as well. So beware if you write something in the chat box, everybody can see it. If you haven't already, please click on speaker view. That will be the best view for you uh, to watch the presentations and hear the discussion. We are going to record the presentations today and they uh, will be available uh, afterwards. Uh, so I, that's okay with all of our speakers and it means if you miss anything, then you'll be able to re-look at it or even share with your friends. As I mentioned, we're launching Parminder's paper today, and that's available in the link uh, in the chat box. We have it in French, Spanish, uh, and English, uh, if you'd like to open it while we uh, discuss it, or uh, if you'd like to access it after the launch. As I mentioned, we're very happy to be working in collaboration with FES, um, who's both an important supporter of workers' rights uh, but also is very interested in how the digital economy is affecting us all. And to open the seminar and to welcome us, it's my pleasure to introduce Sarah Ganter, uh, who's the lead on digitalization and globalization from FES. Thank you, Sandra. Uh, Sarah. Thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is Sarah Ganter, and it is my pleasure to welcome everybody on behalf of Friedrich Ebert Stiftung uh, to this webinar virtual event on uh, economic rights in a data-based society. One could think that in times of pandemics, uh, global pandemics and multiple glo global crises, there are more pre pressing issues to discuss than data politics. And actually, when we started preparing uh, for this webinar, we were even worried whether enough people would sign up. But wrong and that's great. People are still joining. Um, more than 180 participants have read this event. I think this is a great interest. Um, times of social distancing and global lockdown of societies are times of economic prosperity for digital platforms. The digital push that has come along with the COVID-19 pandemic highlighted once more the uh, innovative potential of digital technologies and the use of big data. The pandemic has also brought the problem of data protect protection straight to our private living rooms. The question whether digital, digital, digitalization and datafication will lead to a fairer and ecologically more sustainable economic model is a question of political regulation. It cannot be left to self-regulation of multinational companies. The time is now to reclaim data sovereignty for workers, individual users, and communities. We need to define clear global rules of data governance that make data serve the public interest. And I'm very happy that Parminda is today. He will hope, hopefully explain us how we do this. I'm also very much looking forward to Rosa, Rosa's and Christina's insights from a worker's perspective. And I would like to thank PSI and IT for Change 
for co-hosting this event and also my wonderful team at FES, especially Katarina Lepper for all logistical preparations. Thanks go also to Christine Moore from Redma, who's doing the technical support in the background. Uh, this is for all from my side. I'm very much looking forward to an interesting and fruitful debate. I will mute myself. Great. Th thank you so much for that, Sarah. And thank you to all the team uh, at FES for the support they're giving to, to workers' rights, uh, but also on these important questions and for the support with the seminar today. I mentioned before, for those who've just joined, that we will take questions from our participants as we go. So if you write into the text box, uh, we will uh, monitor those and you can start asking questions at any time during the presentations. PSI is also very pleased to be launching uh, this report today. We commissioned it because we think that big data and the role it plays in our political economy is not well understood by workers and unions. And we felt this for a couple of reasons. First, it's clear that workers and citizens are creating value by the production of this data, but they're receiving almost no compensation for it. And that's because the value as an individual data point is almost uh, nil, it's, it's negligible. Yet when we collect this data or when large corporations collect the data, um, it's very, very valuable. And it's the corporations that get the uh, profits from that data. And for P PSI, uh, and I think the global labor movement, we see this as another form of extraction of surplus value from labor. And that's really important because it's a significant contributor to rising inequality that everyone's experiencing. We were also worried that it was changing the relationship between labor and capital. And not just because it's undermined a long fought for workplace rights, for example, by facilitating precarious work, although that's very, very important. It's also because it's fundamentally shifting the relationship between the owners of capital uh, and the owners of labor, workers. Um, one of, the, one of the, the main advantages that labor has had historically was that it, it understood the production process better than capital. Uh, you needed workers uh, to make decisions in the production process. But with the ability to process so much data and with the ability for artificial intelligence to make decisions, what we're finding is capital now knows more about the process than workers. And they can make decisions without worker involvement. And when you think about that, that's actually quite a massive shift in the power relationship in the production process. Even in the past, in the last industrial revolution, even though the machine did the work of many, many workers, you still required some workers to turn it on, to maintain it, to understand when it was, was overloading, to turn it off if there was a problem, to regulate it. Uh, and, and workers over time, because of their experience with those machines, became skilled. Uh, they understood the machine, they understood how it worked, they understood when it needed to be maintained. But with the introduction of AI uh, and big data, all of this is changing. And so often the, the owner uh, of the data knows more about the production process than the worker. And this has, as I said, massive implications for the relationship, but in particular for the ability of workers to withdraw their labor. Uh, and we need to understand that. But PSI has a double interest. Uh, both as a trade union, but also as the trade union representing workers in the public services. PSI is also worried that government needs data to make decisions in the public interest uh, to benefit us all, but increasingly this data is held by the private sector and by private sector capital. We think that governments need to guard more jealously this resource, otherwise we'll all suffer. So whether it's the ability to understand traffic flows that perhaps Google or Uber has, whether it's the ability to have the information needed to make decisions about water networks or electricity networks, or even to understand the way in which pandemics uh, spread or uh, the intellectual property around uh, vaccines, or even the regulation of media during elections, government must have access to the information that's required to allow our democracies to function. Otherwise our public services will be undermined and ultimately democracy itself will be undermined. Now these are fundamental political questions, but they're also really practical ones. How do we understand these threats? Is labor still able to organize? If so, how? What do they mean for the delivery of quality public services? And what do they mean for democracy? But for workers to take action, anger is not enough. 
they must have hope that things can change. And, and, and in many cases, we're finding that this hope is ebbing away and we're seeing disengagement from the political process. But Labor has faced these challenges of the introduction of new technology before, and we will again. And I think workers are inventive, and I think workers will find ways to resist. But we must be deliberate in considering this and deliberate in our responses to this. And so if I could just finish with a story uh, from Kieran Goddard uh, from the Alex Ferry Foundation told me just a few days ago when he, 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 he was talking to an Uber driver and the Uber driver was saying that, he, that, this, that they had formed a WhatsApp group with about 100, 120 other drivers. And with, um, with Uber, the price of the uh, ride uh, changes depending on the demand in certain areas. And what this WhatsApp group had done was they realized that if all the, if all the Uber drivers in a certain area that, that they knew was in high demand, if they all vacated that area and went to the edges of that area, it would show that there was a lot of demand there, but not many drivers and the price for the rides in that area would go up. And then those workers could then uh, from the periphery of that area come in and, uh, and take those rides at a much higher price. But this tactic only works if everybody does it. It only works if there's trust amongst those uh, workers. Um, and all of those workers must identify that they have a common interest. And so those workers may not have seen it this way, but that was actually union activity. It was collective action. And so if you like, it was a, a form of temporary strike. And what it shows to me is that workers intuitively understand what needs to be done. Uh, and it gives me hope. It gives me hope that we can exercise some power and control over this new form of technology. But to do this, uh, we really need to start at the beginning and ask ourselves, why is all this happening? And Parminda, your paper describes that. Uh, it describes the change in the political economy that's happened across uh, the globe because of the emergence of big data and AI. And I just wonder, Parminda, if you can start by telling us what you mean uh, by this and what is uh, described in your paper. Thank you, uh, Daniel, and thanks to Sarah and the rest of the FES team for organizing this and also helping me organize uh, this report. So Daniel, uh, thanks for an excellent introduction. And you are right that if we have to, you know, fight successfully the new, uh, new digital issues uh, in favor of labor power, we need to understand what is happening. What is the theory behind it? Uh, what is the political economy of a digital society? And uh, let me step back. Uh, a political economy of any social arrangement is basically arranged around its principal resources. When it was an agrarian feudal system, uh, land was the principal resource. And we understand and we know that everything in a feudal society was around relationships of land. Who owned the land? Who was a serf? Who gets the produce? What happens? So everything, everything, who was the king? Who was the subject? Everything was around land. And then we moved to the industrial society. Everything was around ownership of factories and machines, and that became the capital. Uh, and our current thinking about the capital labor struggle is largely situated in that industrial paradigm. What has happened actually uh, is that the things have changed. We read a lot about data being the new oil or the new gold. Uh, clearly, everybody seems to agree that data is the most valuable thing in a digital society. Now, that must be surprising that if something is the most valuable resource uh, in a particular paradigm, why don't people talk more about what is the value of that resource? How it is denominated? Who owns that resource? What are the allocatory principles around that resource? Because it's very basic. You couldn't have a, a feudal society without describing uh, allocative uh, principles around land. Same with uh, industrial society. But around data, while people agree that it's the central value, people don't talk about allocating the value of it. And, and there lies a tale. Uh, because immediately the issue would arise, who, who should legitimately own that value? And I think even to understand the value of data, uh, people think of data as something, well, you know, it is problematic, but not really what is problematic about it. So let's think of 
it not in terms of data, but in terms of intelligence. After all, what does data do? If somebody takes my data, what does that person do with that data? The person develops intelligence about me. So we should be thinking about the central resource as being intelligence and not so much data. Data contributes intelligence. And once you start looking at intelligence, somebody owning your intelligence, and you are right, uh, Daniel, about how somebody knows about the production processes more than the worker who's next to that machine. What we have started to do is to outsource our intelligence systematically, outsource the intelligence of how we organize our lives. Google knows more about it. Outsource the intelligence about the driver not knowing where the customer is because Uber knows it. So this is a case of outsourced intelligence. And what happens with outsourced intelligence is that there are huge global corporations, which is the new form of economic organization in the digital society, which become the sole collectors of data from all places. And they use the data to convert into intelligence about everything. And this centralized intelligence then controls all actors in a sector systematically, whether it's Uber and drivers, Amazon and manufacturers and traders and logistics, or now in health education and, and such services. And I'll give, quickly give an example of what does it mean. A Daimler CEO, Daimler is the maker of Mercedes, said a few years back that what Google and Apple is going to do is to be the brains of the cars and we would just be making the shells. So we should start looking at these digital corporations as being the brains of large ecosystems which control the sectors. So these are the kind of things which are happening and I'm ready to uh, take it forward uh, in further questions. Yes, Daniel. Okay, thanks, Parminder. I mean, that that point of um, of the information being the value of cars, I think, is one that people uh, can relate to because you know we, we're hearing about um, driverless cars. We, we're seeing Uber becoming a, a platform for for taxis, um, and I think some. I think a lot of people understand intuitively the implications uh, for this uh, in in these areas. But what does it mean for public services and what does it mean for workers? Let's, uh, let's go back to the example of the industrial uh, society again, because I think we are into a paradigm change and it helps to understand a new paradigm in relation to the old one. What did the public sector do in the industrial society? Uh, it, it developed infrastructures. These were those services where there were market failures or there were natural monopolies and therefore you needed a different kind of a centralized player to organize them. We had infrastructures, telecommunication, transportation, roads, sports, even banking. Uh, and that it also delivered welfare services, which whether centralized or not, were necessary for everybody to have equitably. Now what is happening in a, in a digital society is that on one side, the infrastructure roles are slipping away from the hands of the public sector. There are infrastructure roles which are new to a digital society. They seem to already have been taken over by digital corporations and Google has become an infrastructure of information organizing. Facebook is your infrastructure on which media rights to be able to reach people. Amazon, and we can talk about COVID now, what Sarah was talking about is becoming a system of essential supplies. And rather than FedEx in the US Amazon being dependent on FedEx, it's FedEx dependent on Amazon and Amazon is going to replace uh, FedEx as its postal service and have its own postal service. So it becomes a system ex essential deliveries. So we're some of the new digital infrastructures uh, like information systems and communication systems are already, they were born um, digital and private, but even the existing infrastructures like I was talking about postal system, but also transportation like uh, Uber is doing uh, is becoming now privatized. So the public sector is seeing this role of infrastructure uh, development and management split, slipping out of their hands. And also the core functions like public education, health, et cetera, is increasingly gets datafied. And now what happens when something gets datafied and digitalized is that we tend to think of something when it is digital and technology as essentially private automatically you go to an office uh, and you want to you know uh, 
uh, talk about something digital, they'll get the technical people to talk to you because they think, oh, well, it's digital, it's, it's technical, and, and therefore it's something which a private sector uh, would do best. Now, what it may have been right when the technologies, digital technologies were new, and we needed that private sector help. But by and by, as owners of digital technologies, the big digital corporations are eating up real substantive sectors like transportation, essential supplies, and so on, everything gets privatized. So for the public sector, the challenge, of course, is to claim back its positions. How to claim back the traditional industrial infrastructures like transportation, et cetera, which it, in any case, controlled, and how to take control of new infrastructures like the Google search infrastructure, cloud computing infrastructures, and so on. And this is happening in sector after sector. Uh, in health, if the data collection has to be done, the National Health Service would outsource it to Google because they think Google can do it better. But by and by, the competencies which Google develops about health sector, which are in the intelligence of that sector, becomes so valuable that that part becomes the top of the value chain of the health sector. And therefore, Google starts controlling the health sectors. So what is happening by and by is that the public sector is role, losing its core role and big digital corporations are taking it over. And then, of course, there's an the issue of territorial, uh, the nation state being territorial, and most of these corporations are global. And therefore, the chances of uh, territorial public sector being able to stand up to a global corporation is, is greatly reduced. Uh, and this is the kind of situation which is going ahead so fast that soon we would have private sector giving all the infrastructural and so-called welfare services as well, and the role of uh, the public sector is greatly reduced, and we are moving into that kind of a situation. Yes, Daniel. Yeah, thanks, Pamit. Look, that's exactly uh, some of the reasons why PSI is so uh, concerned about this. We we've seen um, the digital economy uh, facilitating privatization uh, in the last decade or so, but it seems that as the data is owned by the private sector and it's increasingly being relied upon by the public sector, that, that speeds up that process of privatization, but also control. It means the private sector who owns the data uh, have control over some very important uh, uh, infrastructure. But the other thing we're noticing is that um, the reverse is occurring. Um, and, and in many parts of the world, not all, uh, but in many parts of the world, um, there, there's a high degree of trust in government uh, and people, people allow government to have data uh, that they wouldn't allow other people to have, their health records or their children's school records, uh, their water bills. Uh, and we're also seeing the reverse occur and that is that companies are, are trying to um, uh, force parts of the public sector to be privatised so they can capture that data before the government even realises or the public sector realises how valuable that data is. Um, in, and we're seeing that with health records. And there's been scandals in the US and the UK where um, very cheap contracts have been let to, to supposedly to save costs. Uh, but what's happened is the reason why those contracts have been so cheap in the health sector is because the company that has uh, managed the IT infrastructure has then used the data that it's got and sold it to other parties or used it for other parties for marketing. Um, and we've seen it, for example, in my own country, uh, Australia, where um, the land titles service has been outsourced very cheaply. The government got a great uh, deal on that. But the reason why the company wanted it was because the data that's held in the land register is extremely valuable for the real estate market. Uh, and I don't, I, I'm not always sure that uh, governments understand uh, the value of the data that they are giving away or allowing to go out um, into the private sector. So all of these reasons really is, is why PSI was so keen to commission uh, the paper in the first place. But Paminda, it's, it's one thing to understand how we're being disadvantaged by this uh, and how corporations are taking advantage of it. But what can we do about it? What are the, what are the policy solutions uh, that you propose in your paper to remedy uh, this situation for, for the public sector uh, and for workers and for citizens? So yes, uh, Daniel, I'll, I'll take from your point of governments not understanding the value of data. People also don't understand the value of data. And as you had said earlier, the value of data is in aggregates. 
and nobody is ready to talk about the value of aggregate data and collective rights to data. The first thing, therefore, we need to do, and it's so obvious because if data is the principal resource of a digital society, uh, as I spoke earlier, like with the case of feudal society, without allocations of relationships and rights around land, you couldn't have a well-organized uh, uh, feudal society. And so with the industrial society, the first thing we need to do is to understand who should own the value of data. And here the principal problem is that the default here is whoever collects data owns the entire value of data, not because there is a law that that person has the rights to that data because there is no law that who has the rights to data. So anybody who collects any kind of data has the entire economic rights to data. And the only thing we really need to talk about uh, is privacy and all, which is very important as human rights level, but economic rights level are also important where we don't talk about the value, not just of individual data, which has some value, but a huge amount of value in an artificial intelligence based society increasingly is of the anonymized and other forms of non-personal data. So the first thing we need to do is to actually write down in our laws that data economic rights belong to the source of the data as an individual, but as importantly as a community. Now, if you have anonymized data about commuting patterns of New Delhi, that data is not something anybody who collects it can run away and own its entire economic value. That data belongs to the city of New Delhi. That city has, should we have have ways to license that data, control its uses, say that this data would only be used by cooperatives for some parts of or some kind of functions, it only be used by cooperatives. We need to do first, what we need to do is write down a law about economic rights to data and what in India we started to talk about community ownership of data. Once you talk about community data and community ownership of data, from that also we are able to derive other forms of collective ownerships of data. For example, Uber drivers can collectively own the data which they contribute, which alone makes Uber such a big corporation. The New Delhi Uber drivers collectively own the data which Uber, uh, the drivers give to Uber. And the Uber operation in New Delhi is based on that data. And this kind of right to that data should be able to, for example, claim some kind of a co-ownership of Uber operations. They can insist that there should be some seats on the board of Uber and this kind of co-ownership of by workers uh, of, uh, of industries is something which the German constitution, I understand, already has. So use data rights, collective data rights to co-own or participate in decision making uh, in the digital corporations is a big thing. But then we have to uh, do many other kind of uh, policies. We have to ensure that the data systems and intelligence systems of a society are distributed and federated. It would require many kind of legal and technostructural systems, which I can not go into in, at length here, but there are some initiatives happening. For example, there is a initiative called GAIA, G-A-I-A-X in EU about a federated digital ecosystem. There's another one which government of India is coming out. So we need to have digital systems, its data systems and intelligence federated. Uh, we have to reclaim uh, public sector's role, some kind of roles in the new digital ecosystems, for example, data infrastructures, uh, interoperability platforms. Again, a lot of work is happening in Europe and some in India as well have to be reclaimed as public sector roles Third thing, we need to look at nation-based strategies. A lot of global trade rules talk about free flow of data and uninhibited play for global digital corporations so that there is a single global economy where these global corporations can play. Now that does not allow the territorial national states to claim some part of the digital ecosystem as theirs, whereby they can develop public systems as well. So we need to, you know, kind of slightly territorialize the global uh, digital economy. And of course, at a more immediate level, we have to, in the public sector, configure policies, how to manage outsourcing uh, to technology players, how to retain control over that outsourcing, who, how to retain control over data, how to control, uh, retain over intelligence and retain ownership uh, over them. 
uh, these kind of issues then uh, become important. Yes, Daniel. Daniel, you're mute. You're mute, Daniel. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Thanks, Belinda. Um, you've outlined some of the reasons why uh, big data and AI have changed the political economy. Um, Rosa, you represent 670 unions across the world. Uh, Parminda has outlined uh, what he thinks some of those changes are. Um, do you agree that public services will be undermined if governments don't deal with this in a, in a, in a really different way? Yeah, uh, thank you, Daniel, and uh, thank you, Parminder, for uh, this very uh, interesting and rich uh, introduction. Uh, let me first take the opportunity to thank uh, FES for the cooperation on uh, these important uh, issues that will impact our society is already impacting and it will impact uh, in future even more and also thank you to um, it for change and parminda to provide us uh, such an important paper uh, uh, where we can base our work uh, in uh, in the future uh, we have been dealing as trade union movement and uh, particularly in the public services uh, looking at how digitalization can impact uh, the labor conditions and also the provision of public services, whether it can allow um, uh, broader access to public services or uh, instead uh, uh, restricting this uh, possibility, this possibility uh, to access public services. Uh, as many of the trade unions around the world, we have been looking uh, at the issue of how many jobs we are going uh, uh, to lose uh, uh, while uh, um, artificial intelligence is replacing uh, uh, human workers or, and uh, um, while uh, um, uh, digitalization is uh, taking over uh, many services. And of course, this is part of the concerns that we have, but I would say, as already uh, Daniel mentioned at uh, the beginning, uh, trade unions has always been uh, uh, facing with changes uh, uh, brought by technology, innovation technology in, uh, in uh, different areas. And uh, for sure, public services will be affected uh, um, by digitalization. But I would say that uh, uh, not only public services can be undermined, but our uh, uh, um, democratic societies uh, can uh, be seriously undermined uh, if uh, a regulation is not imposed by governments and not only by governments. I want to bring, uh, you know, a, an example that comes from my recent observation of how the situation is. I come from Italy and I come from uh, uh, Lombardy uh, that has been one of the most affected area by COVID uh, uh, around the world. Uh, almost half of the uh, infections and half of the death uh, in Italy happened in, in my region. So I've been looking how government uh, was dealing with this situation very close. Uh, I must say that uh, the issue of data has been, uh, you know, a subject for some intellectual elite uh, in the, um, in the, uh, political framework of my country until the recent past. But since COVID mm, mm, break, break out, uh, broke out, we had this uh, um, discussion because of uh, the decision of the government uh, to monitor and track uh, people with the app on the mobile. And it turned out in something completely different compared to what I thought it was previously. 
many people getting involved, many people getting interested to know how, what happened to my privacy, what happened, uh, you know, to the information that I can share through that app, uh, uh, and who can use uh, that. And the discussion has been very, very uh, interesting and somehow hot. Uh, to the point that the Italian government has decided not to call on one of the big data companies, but to rely on an Italian uh, startup and negotiating with them through an independent agency that is going to be created uh, about the use of data and the fact that those data has to be available uh, only until the end of the year. But what happens in a globalized world if a citizen traveling from Italy to Germany is tracked and uh, uh, being infected, uh, monitor and sharing the information when Germany has decided to contract Google? Uh, to try to release the tap and track uh, and track uh, citizens. This is undermining the capacity of having a common uh, communication system about uh, of our public services, uh, something that can interrelate, particularly in an area uh, that is uh, so easy to um, mobility and exchanges uh, uh, as it is uh, the, European, uh, the European Union. But more broadly, we have seen how, uh, you know, uh, from uh, a, a local infection, uh, COVID turned out to be a pandemic uh, in, the globalized, uh, in the globalized world. And so I think that, yes, government have to take initiative to protect uh, uh, public services and to protect uh, and to protect uh, uh, data um, and also to consider as Parminder correctly highlighted uh, the fact that, that data are not uh, simply you know information that we exchange they are another source of uh, uh, intelligence they are another source of capital we have uh, you know the the resource uh, of uh, of capital uh, we have uh, the factor of the human labor that contribute uh, to create uh, the wealth of a country and data has to be the third factor that we consider and that uh, has to be um, to become the new common good that we want uh, that we want uh, to protect uh, I think that uh, uh, this experience we are all uh, living in, uh, along with uh, having uh, um, uh, shared the light on uh, the importance of public services, uh, and the fact that uh, the narrative on uh, investing in public services uh, had changed since the just few two months ago three months ago the discourse is completely different i'm not sure at the very end the solution will be different uh, uh, if i look at the experience of 2008 but i think that we need uh, to um, to beat the drum now uh, that uh, the situation is very uh, is still very present and everyone uh, feel to be uh, engaged and involved. And uh, I think that uh, this uh, issue of uh, digitalization, artificial intelligence will probably be um, somehow, um, you know, reconsidered, reconsidered or uh, considered under a different light uh, um, if we really will be able uh, to uh, learn the, the lesson of, uh, of this pandemic, where uh, um, the use of artificial intelligence has to become something that helps 
um, uh, easing uh, the uh, the provision of services, uh, the um, the capacity of uh, of the state of the government to deal with a complex society. Uh, but not uh, the response uh, to uh, the overall uh, uh, debate uh, on uh, how to reduce the, the impact of, um, uh, of human labor. There's also the other side of the narrative that we need to consider and be aware that that can be a real threat because uh, part of the you know, debate uh, that is ongoing is also the fact that artificial intelligence can actually replace uh, human labor uh, where humans show to be so, um, so weak to be affected by a pandemic why probably a robot won't. Uh, uh, won't. Well, maybe they can be affected by other virus, technological virus, not, uh, not uh, biological. Uh, and this is the other side of the coin. But I think that uh, we need to, to be aware that, uh, and also as trade union, we can play a role in, in that part, uh, that uh, showing that the capacity of response uh, that uh, human, uh, uh, workers uh, can provide uh, when an emergency happens, uh, uh, like the pandemic uh, showed, uh, cannot be asked, it cannot be uh, replaced by uh, artificial intelligence. And also that uh, uh, artificial intelligence and digitalization uh, must help in the uh, recovery phase of, uh, from the COVID and in the preparation of the new approach to development uh, uh, to try to address uh, the systemic uh, disease of our globalized economy rather than challenging uh, further the capacity of uh, uh, developing um, in a sustain uh, economical and environmental um, sustainable way, uh, way our society. Governments have to lead in that sense, but uh, I think that uh, a stronger global cooperation would be needed. And I'm wondering under the circumstances if that would ever be possible uh, in a world that, that is uh, uh, not using even such a pandemic uh, to try to strengthen multilateral cooperation and rather uh, raising further, uh, further con conflict and, uh, and walls. Uh, I would Great. stop here for the moment. Thank you. I mean, I think, thanks, Rosa. And you, you raise a really important point about the global financial crisis and the fact that um, just because we have a huge disruption doesn't mean that we make progress. You know, it really does need to be, to be fought for. Um, and you made some, I think, some important points about the role of the state uh, and the role of the government and public sector. And we're getting some really interesting questions in the uh, text box about that, about you know, who do we trust more, the, uh, the uh, government or a corporation? How do we hold governments to account? And I, I'm gonna come back to some of these questions uh, in a moment. Um, but before I do, I'm gonna bring Christina in because she's been waiting uh, patiently. If, these, um, if some of the questions in the text box um, tell us anything, it's that there, there's a lot of questions to be asked. And I think we're a long way from having workers who understand uh, all of these issues. Uh, and if they're not thinking about these issues and they don't understand them, well then how do they, how do they demand the, some of the solutions that both Rosa and Parminda uh, have been suggesting? So really, the, Christina, the question is, what do we need to do to better inform workers about these issues? Uh, and should we as unions start to make uh, the digital economy empowering uh, for all? And if so, how? Thank you, Daniel. Really, really interesting and, and great to see uh, all those questions and responses in the chat. Thank you to all of the organizers for inviting me. Now, big questions are being put, uh, put sort of in the air here, right? And to what Rosa was saying, if I can cheekily respond and say, 
if there's been the biggest letdown in the last 10, 15 years, it's been from our governments. I think we have, for the majority of governments across the world have proven that they are cornering themselves into positions where they're even scared to regulate, i.e. the demand will have to come from the people. And this is where I think there's a fundamental role for the unions to capture uh, all of the inequalities that are happening, not least because of data and the structuring of data. So, but to answer your question, uh, how, how, do we, how do we get the workers mobilized around these issues? I think first and foremost, this is a question of, and again here we have had a total lack of public awareness building. This must be our role. Right down to the shop stewards, our members in the workplaces, we should start talking about data. We should start talking about how we are producing it, as, as Parminda mentions in this paper, all the time as citizens, but also as workers. But we will also need to work really hard on overcoming that tyranny of convenience. How we have become accustomed in many parts of the world to saying, yeah, well, you know, as if, if something was given to us for free. You know, we have fallen for the convenience of ordering our pizzas online or listening to music online without really, really questioning what are we giving away here. So I think awareness building is a fundamental role of the unions, it's a fundamental role of PSI in relation to your members. But also, I think, and, and again, let me be a little bit uh, cheeky. When we talk about the fundamental economic rights uh, and the principles here, I think we've got to be very careful that we don't leave, if we talk about this with with our, our members, then with a sense that this is a monetary value necessarily. I think we really have to talk about data in a human rights uh, uh, context. So what, are, what are, is the influence of these data, the data structuring, the data influencing on our rights to be human, on our human rights, on our privacy rights, and not least on our workers' rights. So awareness first. Secondly, we have to start governing. And the best thing unions can do is start governing uh, this, these data-driven systems that are of course in workplaces, in public offices, through our collective agreements and or law. Um, but this is, this is an immediate drive. And just to give you an example of the importance of workers' data rights, in the GDPR, there were far more articles on workers' data rights uh, in the draft of the GDPR that were removed in the very last second. In California, which has a GDPR light, there's an amendment on the table to exempt workers from the data protection. So workers' data uh, is very valuable, the data that's mined on us at work, and it is, must be the union push to start regulating that. So, you know, we really need to build the basic knowledge, we need to train our shop stewards, our staff reps, and then we need to start pushing for collective agreements for governance of these issues. Uh, to overcome this tyranny, so to speak, in Tim Wu's words of convenience. All right, Christina, I've got a follow-up question. I, I mean, I've read the paper, and I know you have, and Parminda's suggesting a radical solution, the creation of, of uh, community collective rights uh, to, to big data. Now, there'll be a lot of interest that'll be fundamentally opposed to this. Um, I mean, I work on trade issues, for example, and I know that you know, these, some of these large companies have created in our trade agreements, these investor state dispute resolution clauses precisely to protect their property rights. Um, so this is, I mean, this is not a small proposition that Parminda is making. Is the agenda too radical? Uh, and what do you see the challenges um, uh, or the shortcomings in, pra in a practical or a sort of a, a, a political sense of the approach Parminda is taking? That's an excellent question. I mean, I would say it's too radical not to get involved in this. It will be far too radical to let our democracies go. As Rosa was talking about, you know, our democracies are at stake here by the private capture of the necessary information for our governments to even govern uh, on behalf of their citizens. So that would be far too radical. But is the idea plausible? Yes. But there's lots and lots of intermediate steps that we need to take to, to actualize the idea of the collective rights of data and, and as, as Parminda mentioned in his paper, also the establishment of data trusts. So the collective uh, pooling of data so that it benefits, for example, the workers, this could be done through 
trade union data trust, through our credit unions, those who still have them connected to them. So, so no, it's not a radical idea. But I think, again, we have to take some intermediate steps. We have to roll back. We have to make sure we have the workers with us. We have the awareness with us and that we continuously talk about this in a rights perspective. Now, I realize rights are not particularly sexy, right? Um, what for one generation uh, was a battle, the next takes for given. But as the paper very clearly argues, and also some of the comments here, is that our rights are actually at threat. And I would fundamentally say our rights to be human are at threat because we very soon will be seen as a massive amount of data points that can be manipulated to vote in a particular way, to buy a particular good, to watch a particular film. So, you know, I think we have to do our groundwork, hurry up slowly, so to speak, and, and build that. Although I would say in relation to Prime Minister's paper, please, all of you, if you haven't read it, do read it uh, and really start discussing this at home. I think we have to be very careful about the profound concepts used in this paper. So economic rights and data ownership, right, which could, if you don't understand sort of the, the, the if you don't unpack those concepts, could very quickly lead into this monetary understanding or this objectification of data and of, of uh, this whole discussion of ownership. So I would really push or maybe that we start talking about data access, data control, that th those are the concepts that we from the, from the union, from the worker side uh, fight for. Now, I would also say that, that we have to be careful here on, on two things and they're ideas that are floating around in many corners. And that is whether we should be paid for our data or whether we can pay to protect our, our privacy. And for me, both of these two ideas are very, very dangerous. We must never let privacy rights be a tradable good. Uh, we, must never, we must never end in a situation where it's a class-defined privacy right. So here again, if we pack this into a human rights, into a social rights, economic rights, fundamental rights perspective, that would be much stronger. And then just one last comment here and, you know, in, in more practical terms, you know, when you're saying, is this a radical idea? Why should we do this? Then I would answer with a question and say, well, what would happen if we don't? And there I think Parminder's paper is extremely strong in pointing out the threat to our democracies, the threat to live beyond oppression from an algorithm. Right. I mean, we must never end in a situation where a worker doesn't see a job online because an algorithm a priori has decided that that person is unfit for the job. We must never create this normalization <coughs> of workers according to an algorithmic um, significance. So for me, the last thing I would urge unions to do is to try and set an alternative digital economic agenda. One where we fight for data minimalization, we stop this hoarding and hoarding of data. Where we fight for that data should be ephemeral, that it should dissolve itself. That we don't just have this legacy data where we'll in the end have to ask the question, what rights should my digital self have when I am dead? We must never end in this situation. So I think Pam Minder's paper really offers some sound possibilities and forces us to think into what could be an ideal future and then how do we set that agenda as progressive forces in practical ways okay thanks um christina i mean that that's quite a couple of quite interesting critiques of parminder's paper and in the text box we're seeing a lot of questions about um, the role of the state and i think that's in a moment we'll get to that that's going to drive us into questions about um, economic value or regulation or use or control or ownership and i think these are questions that we, we do need to pick through and i'm going to ask some of those in a minute but in a second i'm going to ask uh Paminda just to respond to some of the critiques he's heard um for me I, I must say when i think about ownership because i'm I, i'm not deeply immersed in the digital world i think about um uh, musicians or, or people who, who, who have who, who, who are creatively uh, create creative content and so you can write a you can write a song uh, or a book and it goes out there in the public sphere and everybody uses it and reads it and your publisher might actually own it 
uh, and, and somebody else might buy a book that has your words in it. But every time it's used, uh, a little, a little or, or sold or some economic value is created from, from the, the creation process, um, a little notch uh, is rung up some, somewhere. And for anyone who's ever written a book or written a song, you know, every, every six months, somebody somewhere sends you a check uh, because your creative work is being used. And so you've got, you've got a little bit of the value of that that, that flows back to you. Uh, and you have some, some control over it because as the creator, whilst you lose control over a, a number of ways in which that your creation uh, can be disseminated, you're also able to set down some rules as to the way in which that happens. And so for me, I, I think about it in, in that way to try and stop it seeming too radical. But I want to throw it to Parminda. You know, you've heard a few of us now critique your paper. What do you have to say about some of the things that have been said, in particular the stuff that Christina said uh, about the way in which we, we term it or the way in which we talk about rights versus ownership? Uh, thanks, uh, Daniel. And I, I meant to go to that point. Uh, thanks, Christina, for an excellent critique. We have been going back and forth, and my ideas have developed through these discussions. Uh, thanks for calling any opposition to these ideas as radical. Uh, and uh, uh, and going, I know, I let me go to the heart of it, the excess of control or ownership. And I think, and I, I maybe I have a very narrow way of looking and digging deep to the same points, but you know, look, look at it, how things are. We talk of excess and control to those things which generally are understood to be ours, but somebody in a devious underhand or some other way is stopping uh, our access to it. Uh, so, so excess and control are those kind of impediments in our enjoyment of a thing. Ownership is different. So first I establish an ownership over something, then for example, I have rights to so-and-so. And then the issue of excess and control issues come because even if I own things as such legally, there would be a lot of impediments which powerful players can bring up, which is the reason excess and control diffuses the issue. It just doesn't hit hard enough to what we are trying to talk. And we are in this middle of a digital society where things are passing out of our hands very quickly. So, you know, I talk about uh, excess and control and the company would say, yeah, yeah, you are right. Moment they say I am right, I get, you know, alarmed because I don't want them to say I am right. And they say that when I use the word excess. Uh, so I say, no, I'm not talking about what you are talking. So I want to be very clear that I'm not talking about what you are talking. And in that sense, I say, no, it's about ownership. And then he doesn't have an answer because ownership is property. I don't like those words, but here the Default is they have it. We need to take it back from them. Copyright, it was different. Knowledge was free. It could be easily copied. And they had to uh, kind of use laws to uh, kind of uh, firewall it. So I think these are the reasons we are by strong terms of primary economic rights or ownership are important. Access and control are too weak. Company says, yes, it says we are also agree. And then the problem starts. My main problem with those things are that. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Pamid. I mean, I, I, when I explain it to people, I also talk to them about mineral rights. And I know the, the uh, example is probably overused, but you can own your, uh, a piece of land, but if you find oil underneath it, the government uh, says, look, in most countries, we are, you know, this is a collective responsibility of the community, that oil. And even if a private company comes to dig it up underneath private land owned by somebody else, the fact that all of the ownership rights flow from the government to those minerals means the government maintains some control over it. And I think that's the point that Parmind is making. But it does raise a secondary question. And it was, it, it's been raised a couple of times in the, in the text box. And I'll ask Parminda firstly to respond. There will be some people who will be fundamentally concerned about the government having uh, ownership rights, uh, even collectively on behalf of the population, of, of such enormous amounts of data. And, and, and there are, it is, I, mean, I think we do need to acknowledge, there are, there are very many countries where people feel more protected by foreign multinationals' uh, uh, controls over their data than they might over their own government having access to a lot of their own data. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put that to Parminda, and I'll probably ask um, both Rosa and Christina to comment on that point as well in a moment. Yeah, I know. It's, it's a very long uh, debate over this. We should have a seminar on it, and I'll try to be short. Uh, 
I completely agree. And that is why we talk about words like data constitutionalism, digital constitutionalism. We think that we need almost a new pillar of the state to be talking about data part of the, the new digital society equation. Now, this looks utopic things, but when industrial society came, there were very basic changes in the nation state. And here we need to have a pillar of the state, constitutional pillar of the state, which is separately dealing with data, which is completely separate from the executive. And I understand the fear. It's, it's quite like police. And I give an example of police. State's definition is to be able to have uh, this monopoly of legitimate coercive force. Now, would you, and policies are bad in developing countries, but would you rather have that police be controlled by a foreign country? Because, because that won't work in the long term. Immediately, we may say that let a foreign owner own our police, but we know finally it wouldn't work. It's like that. We'll have to fight our battles and within our democracies and our nation states. And that battle cannot be outsourced by outsourcing our data to foreign servers. That wouldn't work. Christina, did you want to comment on that? Yeah, thanks. I mean, so so everything solid melts in the air, right? And I think we're at a time this COVID nineteen crisis, you know, has revealed all the flaws of the neoliberal system, and it's now that we can start proposing all of these radical uh, ideas. And I think one of them is, and the paper alludes to that too, that we start really talking about the collective pooling of of data. You know, the unions, it would be a brilliant starting point for the unions to build data trusts, to pull the workers' data. There was an example in the chat here of Uber drivers. If, if they pulled their own data, we've developed a, in, in the lab I've been running an app that could do that, so that in the end, that, that data trust became so powerful, Uber would have to ping that data trust for information. We could do that. The unions could do it with the right minds. And on the question of do we trust states to have all of this information, but you know what? They don't have to have it. There's now brilliant uh, uh, digital systems called federated databases, which would again allow for the pooling of collective data. The state could then ask for access to this data without actually seeing the individual's data, but they could ping it for for the information that they need. So they could get the information they need without owning the data. And I, I, here I mean own as in the property rights. So, I mean, there's lots of possibilities and it's now that we should really put our minds together, everybody interested in this and say, what type of solution could we start forming? And there's brilliant, and I think several people on the, on the um, participant list here are working on data trusts, are working on uh, credit unions and so forth. So I think absolutely this is something that we should be be brainstorming about and thinking about and how we legally can start doing this. And the answer for me is to move away from the individual concept of data protection, data regulation into a collective one of data access control and strength. Right. Look, I've got a couple of very specific questions in the chat box and so I'm going to try and get some of them answered. Um, and the first one um, is, I, I think it's a fascinating one. Um, and again, you could probably have a whole lecture on it. It, it, it says, is data more like labor or capital? Um, or is data a totally different category? And I'm going to throw the Parminder on that. But there's also another question that he might be able to answer. And somebody has written, um, why, wh why would Uber allow a worker to uh, claim a, a right over the data that's created, wouldn't Uber just claim uh, that it's the, um, wouldn't, wouldn't Uber just claim that it's the consumer uh, that's created the data? And so I, another way to ask that question is, perhaps you can explain to us, uh, Parminda, as you're talking about is data more like labor or capital, um, where does the value from the data that Uber uh, collects come from? What, what is the valuable part of it and who actually creates that uh, that, that data that is valuable? Uh, yeah, see, the first part is a very interesting question, actually. Between, I mean, I've forgotten the term a uh, Canadian uh, writer has used. Actually, he calls it something exactly in between uh, a hybrid of uh, labor and capital. Uh, it is like labor. It is contributed by individuals. But once it is get formed, it's like capital. It can be used again and again, and it has its own value. So it's an interesting theoretical question, but a very good way to start understanding what it is. But it, 
in the sense it is like both, therefore it is a third kind of a thing. Uh, to to, to uh, speak about the Uber thing, see, the, I'll ask, answer the second question first. Where does the value lie? The value lies in it being intelligence about something. Data's value is in being intelligence about how, how I do webinars. Some person understands how I do webinars from my data. That is intelligence about me, how I do webinars. It has some commercial value. How we as 100 people interact is a knowledge about us, intelligence about us, which can be commercially useful. So, and my theory is that intelligence about something should be owned by that person. It's a moral philosophical argument as well. So now going back to the Uber part, the question is about whom is it intelligence about? Somebody asked, why wouldn't it be consumer? Yes, it is intelligence about consumer, but a lot of Uber's intelligence is about how fast a driver goes, how, how, how long it rests, what does the driver do? As the example which Daniel was giving, driver is now here or outside. So it is intelligence about driver's behavior, one. Two, it is intelligence gathered by resources which are belonging to the driver. The car belongs to the driver. Car is not a property of, uh, of Uber. So data which is either intelligence about me or it is about or collected through a thing which is owned by me and we have tried to develop many theories and a lot of work needs to be done would therefore be something on which I should have a claim of the value of. Okay, I'm going to go through a couple more of these specific questions, and the next one is um, for Rosa. Um, there's a great, there's a great question in the chat, and it says, um, it, it simply says, our leaders just don't get it. Uh, you know, what what can we do to 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 make sure our leaders get it? There's another question there that says, do um, do governments and uh, the private sector both understand it, and is there a race on? Um, I suspect the first question is an answer to the second question, but the, the two combined really for Rosa is, you know, do governments understand what's going on uh, and do they need to do more? And there's also another question in there and I'll bundle this all up for Rosa. Uh, it's a specific question in there about what drove the Italian government to collaborate with the local agencies to analyze the COVID pandemic data? Because I think in, in understanding that story, we might actually have a great example of a government that, that did get it. Rosa? Well, I, I will uh, start answering uh, from this uh, last point. It was not actually an agency to analyze the data, but uh, uh, an independent agency that uh, has uh, to track and monitor in an anonymous way the, uh, the mm, Yes, to monitor in an anonymous way the tracking of the app that uh, they are uh, collecting. I'm wondering how anonymous it can be when you have an app uh, download on your mobile. But uh, what is interesting is that they refused the offer of the big uh, data corporates, of the big data companies. Uh, uh, thinking that it was more trustworthy uh, to having to deal with uh, mm, with uh, local uh, local resources, um, I also understand that it might be different uh, when you talk about a country which is with uh, you know all the limits that our democracies are facing right now. Uh, but still democratic institutions uh, uh, compared to uh, countries where um, data are used not only to influence uh, political election, but for instance, uh, restricting uh, the freedom of people, even collective freedom or even um, uh, arresting people as it happens in many countries, just to think of Turkey before the last elections, political elections and many of the, and I think these are uh, the issues that raise uh, concern in people, how government can use data, uh, how government can uh, 
limit uh, um, individual freedom or collective freedom uh, for political reasons uh, uh, if they own uh, data. And this is why I think uh, we need to be uh, probably bolder, uh, probably stronger and most uh, active in trying to raise all those concerns and all those issues uh, uh, looking for uh, uh, democratic and collective responses uh, to this issue. Uh, workers are not, uh, uh, and trade unions uh, are not really not uh, uh, very much interested or very much involved uh, in, uh, in that. And somehow, uh, I think it's also true. I think uh, it's true and I think uh, our responsibility is uh, to highlight uh, how much it is important, how much uh, uh, they had to get engaged more and more on uh, uh, this uh, on, on this issue and not only when uh, um, the ownership of data is uh, 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 directly uh, connected uh, with uh, mm, with uh, the uh, delivery of service or the impact on jobs uh, and the impact on uh, on labor uh, but also looking at uh, how our individual behave uh, is often uh, contributing uh, to uh, creating this mass of information, mass of data that can be used uh, uh, um, just for profit uh, for uh, many, many companies. I, I mean, it's, it's something different maybe uh, or mm, just another aspect uh, of the issues that uh, we need uh, to, to focus on. But I'm wondering if uh, uh, raising stronger the voice that uh, IT corporates uh, had to be mm, had to pay tax uh, as many other companies as other uh, manufacturing uh, financial uh, corporates or any other. Uh, uh, industrial uh, producer uh, uh, should do or do uh, or does. Uh, it's, uh, it's something that can help us consider those corporate not so different from the other and therefore subjected to common rules to common rules that we need to establish and that uh, uh, we need to, to, uh, to create and to, to impose. It's, it's, you know, I think that uh, it's also the fact that many people think, yes, okay, Google, Facebook, uh, uh, all these uh, tools are something, as Christina said, they are free. You can have uh, access to many services without uh, having to pay. Uh, There's something different. They are total virtual, you know. The, but behind that, uh, there's a machine, a strong machine that is collecting information, that is making money, that is making profit, many times exploiting people, yeah? exploiting people, and also raising the issue of their regulation, of their paying tax uh, is, uh, you know, kind of uh, making them more equal to the other. Uh, to the other corporates and showing people that this is not fighting against the windmills, uh, but this is a, a, a class fight as workers and trade unions that we can lead uh, and we can uh, uh, and we can do together. Um, of course, I think that the more and more we are able to share information, uh, to uh, invest also in educating and training our leaders and our members in that direction, 
can help raising awareness, but also the ability uh, to, to, to look for um, uh, common responses and uh, the capacity to negotiate uh, or at least uh, to call on government uh, uh, to regulate uh, that system and uh, um, not uh, to retract uh, from their responsibility as well. Great. I think Rosa, there we're we're almost at time. In fact, we are at time. So I'm going to get each of the I'm going to get the other two speakers to wrap up. But Rosa, I think raises some really important questions. Some of which are, are in Parminder's paper. The first one being about um, the the network effects of these large tech companies, and the and the way in which we're not regulating them like monopolies. There used to be a time when governments thought it was their business to regulate monopolies, and it seems we've forgotten about that. And I think Elizabeth Warren was introduced into the uh, Democratic primary debate, but it's something I think we all need to be thinking about quite apart from this point about collective ownership. And then taxation. The, the, these large companies, they're the biggest companies on the planet, uh, and they're not paying their taxes. And whatever we do about the rights to collective uh, data, they should at least be paying their taxes and redistributing some of their windfall gains out to the communities. Um, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask um, Christina to provide any last comments because uh, I know she's always got a, a lot to say. And then I'm going to give Parminda the last word just to wrap up uh, before we close. I'm very sorry if I didn't get to your, to your questions. Uh, there's been some fascinating debate. Perhaps it means we have to hold uh, a, a, another uh, uh, a webinar in future to, to follow up from this. But before we thank everyone and say goodbye, I'm just going to ask Christina, do you have any, anything else you want to add on any of these questions? Uh, just three points. Taxation, yes, we should start taxing revenue rather than profit. It will stop uh, the tax haven flight, so to speak. Secondly, negotiate, 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 negotiate. Every single one of you from a union on this call we should really start putting in place the training and the skills needed to negotiate these things. And number three, think of data and the information, the intelligence, as Parminder calls it, as a collective good. And I think this will shift a lot of the outcome uh, of this exercise. And then a huge thank you for, to Parminder for this excellent, excellent uh, article. Great. We've got a few questions in here as well asking for us to collate all the resources that uh, have existed in the, uh, the group chat. I think we'll do that. I think we'll, we'll collate all of those resources. We'll put them in one spot, certainly on PSI website. And if we can, we'll circulate them around to everybody. Paminda, do you want to have any last uh, thoughts? Uh, really quickly, I, two points I need to want to make. One is that the initial phase of digital society was focused on collection of data on the consumption side. We have moved to the second phase where the focus of data collection is on the production side. With the workers, machinery, production, the shopkeepers, the enterprises are the more important data points. And where personal data is less important, but the enterprise and NPD data becomes important. Second thing, fortunately, the good thing is that the worker is in the same situation as a trader or a small manufacturer or a restaurant owner uh, or an you know, Uber owner because all of these are platform dependent actors with the, the platform is squeezing them. The platform is squeezing the manufacturer, he's squeezing the trader, the food delivery companies are squeezing the restaurants, all of them being squeezed on a data and intelligence base. So all of them would be ready to fight together for their data rights. So in that sense, the workers can, for this purpose, expand their fight to all platform dependent actors, which is practically any, everyone other than the platforms, and therefore achieve this collective rights on data and intelligence together. And then we can also go back to our more partisan fights. That, I think that's a fantastic point to finish on, Parminda. Uh, I mean, Everybody's affected by this, whether you're an Uber driver or whether you're a user of a public service, uh, whether you uh, think democracy is being affected because of uh, Cambridge Analytica. Uh, there are so many groups that are uh, affected. And I think the, the way we will make changes is by bringing those groups together to, to demand it collectively. In, in many ways, this is a class issue and a movement issue. Uh, and I think we all, we all need to join together if we're going to have any uh, hope of uh, making some progressive change. Um, that 
uh, brings us to the end. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Parminda uh, for a great paper and a fantastic presentation uh, and really uh, it, quite extraordinary insights into this uh, really fascinating but very complex part of public policy. Thank you very much to Rosa Pavanelli uh, for talking to us about public services, the role of the state, democracy and, and trade unions. Thank you to Christina, uh, who again is an enormous asset to the global labour movement, but also to the digital community. Thank you to FES, uh, without which n any, none of this would have been possible. And thank you, uh, all of the participants, uh, for sharing uh, your insights in the text chat, for, for, for logging in, for taking the time, uh, and hopefully for taking these messages and spreading them uh, out as far and as wide as can be. Uh, for me, uh, that wraps it up. Uh, I hope you have a, a great uh, day and please uh, keep safe uh, in these uh, difficult times. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And thank you, Danny, for sharing and navigating us through this. Bye. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.